We're going to look at a particular scripture here in Luke chapter 2, but I thought it would be good to read from the beginning of chapter 2 because it talks about the birth of Jesus. It's a good thing to read this time of year. So we're in Luke chapter 2, if you want to turn there in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, there are some in the back and you can go get them. So here's what it says in Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. Now, there's lots of things to look at in this chapter, but what I want to look at today and this year is verses 13 and 14. The idea that this angel has appeared to these shepherds, made an announcement, and when he gets done with his announcement, all of these angels appear, and they're praising God and saying glory to God in the highest. Now, what I find interesting about this is that what the first angel has announced to these shepherds does not concern these angels at all. You know, if it was about them, they could say, wow, they could be giving each other high fives and fist bumps and the whole thing and say, wow, yes, oh. And the shepherds would be going, I wonder what they're going on about. But this does not concern the, shep- or the, the angels at all. You know that the Bible says clearly that God does not give help to angels? Jesus did not take on the nature of angels in order to save them. So this does not concern the angels. And yet they're worshiping and praising God for the birth of Jesus. Now, I don't know if sometimes the idea of worshiping God has been a difficult point to you because you might be like these shepherds who see the angel and they go, (coughs) and they're scared to death. And then they hear what the angel has to say, and yet it really doesn't make that much of an impact on them. I know that it doesn't make that much of an impact on me. I can read certain things, and it's just bursting out with praise to God, and I am not moved at all. Certainly not like these angels. And so it makes me wonder Where's the impact that should be happening? How does that affect my life? 
And you might be wondering that too. Maybe you think, well, worshiping is a great thing for women and for children, but I'm a man, and we don't flip out and get freaked out about especially stuff like that. We generally lose our cool about important things like rugby and football and maybe even Star Wars. If we're kind of geeky or go that way, yes. We will lose it over that. I saw somebody's review of Star Wars that didn't want to have, you know, didn't want to betray the plot. No spoilers, so it was all emojis. And the emojis were somebody freaking out. OMG, this is so cool. All right, I'll take that on. So, but what about us guys, especially when it comes to worshiping? What is the excitement? The angels are blown away, and we go, so what? This morning, we want to look at what the angels get that we don't, what they're thinking about that we don't think about, what they understand that we don't understand. Here's what it says here. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, what these angels are doing are spontaneously praising God. That's what it says there. You think, okay, what does it mean to praise? It means to show respect, to show honor, admiration. Here's one definition. Profound, adoring, odd respect. Kind of like, wow. All right? They have a high regard for God, and they are expressing that approval. They are acknowledging what God has done, how valuable it is, and they're expressing who God is. That is, God is good, and God is doing good. So then you have to ask, okay, what has God done? Well, not the main thing, but one thing that God is doing that is so important is that he is fulfilling prophecy. And that is, hundreds and even thousands of years before this point, this night, God has made promises about saving people and redeeming them out of sin and corruption. Now, that's only impressive if you understand sin or corruption. I think everybody's got a good working idea of what corruption is, right? How many people keep a compost bin and put their compost into that? Let me see hands. Come on. Oh, my goodness, we're not that green around here. Oh, dear. Well, I'm glad you guys aren't being filmed right now because they'd be looking at this and then they'd send the trucks around to bust you. So let's not talk about that for a second. But you know, when you've ever had to empty that thing, you understand what corruption is? Because you, you don't even want to deal with it, do you? But somebody's got to, and your dad... So, boys are garbage. So, there I am taking this thing, and you know, it doesn't smell very fresh. It doesn't look fresh either. It's rotting. It's decomposing. It's not pretty. That's the result of sin. Would you believe it? God cursed this world because of sin to futility and to corruption And everything is now corrupting. It's decomposing the entire universe because of sin. And what God is doing is something about that sin. And he's made hundreds, literally hundreds of promises and caused them to be written down in the Old Testament. Here's a few of them that apply in this case 
at, on this evening. The first thing is that, that God would send a Savior. And who the Savior is, is God. Because Isaiah 43, verse 3 says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And in that same chapter of Isaiah, he says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be no more after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. Now, God's promise here is that he alone is the Savior. He has to save. If he doesn't save, nobody else can save. So whoever the Savior is, it has to be God. And then another prophecy being fulfilled on this evening is in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And it says there, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Now, for your comings and goings to be from the days of old, even eternity, you have to be God. Because only God is eternal. And this scripture in Micah is saying that God is going to be born in Bethlehem. Now, even when Micah was making this prophecy, Bethlehem was a little less than a one-horse town. Today, it's still nothing to look at. But he says God is going to be born there. So here's what's being fulfilled. Here's part of what the angels are reacting to. It's all well and good to say, at some point in the future, I'm going to save people. At some point in the future, you can say, well, God will be born in this place. But you know, it's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Right now is when it's being fulfilled and made reality. Now, that's important. Promises are great. Fulfillment is better. And in the end, it's everything. So, what we have here is not some new complex philosophy that you got to be a, a PhD to understand. It is a person, flesh and blood. You can touch him, he's present in our world. And he's the one who is going to fulfill all the promises of God. But here's the main thing about why the angels are praising God. They're not so much praising God or praising the Lord Jesus. What he's done is pretty incredible. But they are worshiping God. They're saying God is good. And it impacts them. It affects them to the point where they're just yelling this out. And I guess they don't care who's watching. Usually, angels don't appear. They don't appear to me. Haven't you always wished that at least an angel would show up, if not Jesus? Wouldn't that be fabulous? They don't, and yet they do here. Now, did God say, three, two, one, go? Or did they just show up and just start worshiping God? I don't know. But it's all directed towards God. And they're glorying in God in the highest. That means in the highest place. And again, when I read this stuff, I think, who cares? What does it matter if God is glorified in some high place? I notice that nobody here is turning cartwheels. And it doesn't grip us, does it? What is in the highest place? Well, it's heaven. 
when you think about heaven, it's the expanse, it's everything that's out there, and it's this place where God rules and he is supreme. So they're saying, let God be glorified in the very highest places where he's at. Why? Why do you say that somebody is great? It's because of something that they've done or it's who they are. And I looked up all the words that kind of go along with this idea of praise and worship. It means that something good is coming from somebody. You cheer that guy who made the play in the game. And it's because he did something. He kicked the ball right. Maybe he kicked it off that guy's head and it went straight in the goal. A great shot. Or maybe some guy gets the Nobel Prize. Something good came from him. He developed a formula. He had an insight into the structure of the universe. Something happened and it came from him. Well, here's what's coming from God. A gift. A gift. That's why we give people gifts on Christmas, because God gave a gift. Now, how important is that gift? Well, when you think about it, you value a gift according to what it costs. And you say, well, that is just mercenary. That's so commerce. But seriously, what it's worth tells you how important that gift is, right? Now, you know, I just received a bunch of stuff that goes along with the medical gear that I use. And one of the things they gave me was a ballpoint pen. And I picked it up and went clicka, clicka. And you know, it's just a ballpoint pen. It's got the name of the company on it. But you know what it is? It's super cheap. Am I going to say, oh, wow. This is a ballpoint pen. It's clear plastic. It's red. It's phenomenal. Here, sweetheart, you play with it. It's just a ballpoint pen. It's nothing to get excited about. Am I going to be internally indebted to these people for giving me a ballpoint pen? Nah. They didn't even care. I know they don't care. So cost, there's nothing in it for them. There's nothing in it for me. How valuable is it for God to give his only begotten son? How valuable is that? Well, you can't compare God to cost. See, we say, okay, the ballpoint pen is worth about three pence. So you line up three pence and you say they equal each other. Maybe you wouldn't even give that much. But how much thing do you put on this side to value God? Well, you can't get enough. See, God could create billions of universes made out of solid gold just like that. Does gold mean anything to him? Or any kind of exotic material you might want to name. He made it. It doesn't mean anything to him. It's here today, gone tomorrow. You can't value God in the way that we would value God. So not even the entire universe, as big as it is, all the stars and planets and everything and everything that's in it, even that cannot express how valuable the Son of God is. So what we say is, he is priceless. His worth goes beyond any possibility of putting a value on it. That's how valuable he is. And now he is giving this person, God himself, to us, to be with us. That's part of the prophecy, that a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name will be called God with us. Emmanuel. Now, 
God is giving the gift and you know when you get a gift or when you give that gift, it's never coming back, right? That's what's supposed to happen. Now, when the divorce happens and everybody's angry at each other, you try to give a gift and you get it right back in your face. But usually you get a gift and you receive it. You say, mine, this is for me. I'm going to keep this gift forever. And that's what we get to do with the Lord Jesus. He's given to us. He is ours forever. Now, what is the Lord Jesus going to do? Right here, the angels say, on earth, peace. Peace. Now, peace is something the world has not had since Adam and Eve sinned against God. As soon as they did, that thing which God told them not to do, forget peace. Because they understood immediately there's something wrong. And there entered into their lives a tension that they never knew before. This sense suddenly that I'm not wearing clothes. I am naked. Is that comfortable? You remember having the dream where you show up, you're, you know you're in class somewhere, but you don't have any clothes on. That awful feeling you have, you think, I'm not wearing any clothes. How did I get here? How am I going to get out of here? Awful feeling. And then they hear the sound of God coming. And that has now become to them like Jurassic Park. Boom. 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 Before it was like, oh great, here he comes, the best part of me. All of a sudden it's like, <gasps> not here, not now. We're dead. What do we do? I don't know. How about in here? Good idea. <sighs> right in the bushes. Boom. Boom. Here comes the awful words. Adam, where are you? <laughs> See, that's what it is for us to meet God now. Want to meet God? No, I'd rather eat peas. I'd rather eat spinach. I'd rather eat shiitake mushrooms. Because we know there's something wrong with us and we can't stand in God's presence and we're dead. Now look, ever since that point, there's been no peace in this world. Zero. There's only conflict. On every level, what's the first thing Adam did? He blame shifted to Eve. The woman you gave me. Oh, great. Fabulous. Way to go. Now I'm the bad guy. Thanks a lot. No place for me to go. I'll talk to you later. Nothing but conflict. What do their kids do? They kill each other. And you know, right now, the way the world is, we've really perfected the art of everything but peace. You know? I mean, you got Nigerian email scammers very sophisticated stuff nowadays. In the old days, you could say, this is a phishing scam. I'm not going to buy in. But nowadays, you don't know if that message came from Apple, do you? Or from Microsoft. You know, I don't think I know this person. Why would I click on this? It's very sophisticated. There's piracy. There's human trafficking. There's guys out there that want you to get hooked on drugs so that you have to buy what they're selling. There's bad business scams going on all the time. When are the banks going to pull another big scheme like they did and practically bring the entire economy of the world down? You know what I mean? It's all going on out there right now. There's unspeakably horrible stuff going on. And in some of our lives right now, there's horrible stuff going on. 
And the angel says, on earth, peace. That's what God is giving, peace. Now here's another interesting fact. When Jesus is growing up and he's preaching the gospel, he says, do you think that I came here to give peace? I tell you no, but a sword. What? Excuse me? Yeah, he says, you know, there's going to be husbands against wives, parents against children, children against parents. It's going to be a mess. Because of me. Because I'm bringing peace. And yet some people aren't going to go for it. In a family, they're going to say, you know what? I don't want that. Don't talk to me about that anymore. Peace, said the angel. Even though it causes conflict after conflict after conflict, Jesus is going to produce peace in every situation. He's going to work out the conflicts, all of them. He's going to overcome. He's just not going to come in and just say, you know, it'd be really great if everybody just quit picking on each other and everybody be nice. He's actually going to do something about it. He moves in to a family. And then he starts bringing everybody in that family into peace. It's interesting how he does it. Huge conflict. But he comes in and he brings peace so that everybody in that family is at peace with God and at peace with each other. I've seen it happen so many times. It happened in my own family. I was the first one to believe in Jesus, and I didn't even want to believe in Jesus. So first, he had to win over me. I did not want to become a weirdo. And, as we all know, all Christians are weirdos. And yet, God did something, and I heard his word, and I believed him. I said, you know what, that's true. So here I am, the only Believer in Jesus in my family. And it caused a huge problem. My brother thought I was completely stupid. And I mean stupid in a kind of get away from me. And that hurt because I really respected my brother and I wanted his respect. And yet there's the conflict. He thinks I'm an absolute, total, dweeb idiot. And guess what? Now in this, this year... All my family are believers, every one of them. And God did something. You know what he did? He sort of waged a war of peace, and he won. That's what Jesus is doing here. On earth, peace. Right now, he's infiltrating families. And he's causing disruption and upheaval because he means to work it out for good and to make real peace. And first of all, it's peace with God. You can't be at peace with anybody else until you're at peace with God. And he says, you're a sinner. And you say, no, I'm not. Yes, you have broken every commandment. Uh Uh-uh, no way. What we have here is a huge conflict. And he works it out. He says, you know what? You are a sinner. And at some point, the word comes to you with power and you say, you know what, you're right. If everybody in this place knew what I've done and the thoughts that I've thought, they would know I am a sinner. There are things in me I don't want anybody to ever find out about. Everybody's got them. God says, that's what I'm talking about. So he says, you know what, you're a sinner. And here's what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to make peace. I'm going to send my son, and he's going to take what you did upon himself. And so that my punishment is not going to fall on you, it's going to fall on him. And I will most certainly punish him so that he knows and he experiences everything that you should experience, including complete eternal separation from me That's hell. 
And that's what it means for Jesus to be born on the earth is that he's going to make peace and it means he came to die. And the angels are going, wow! Amazing! They cannot contain themselves. Because first of all, here's God whom the heavens of the heavens can't hold and he just became really small. Super small. You couldn't do it. It would be like me going into the world of bacteria so that I could rescue bacteria. Please, all bacteria, listen to me. This is the gospel. You'd say, why would you do that? They're not worth anything. Just use some and kill the bacteria. But don't save them. Where would you keep them? Here's my little bacteria collection. They're all mine. Hi, everybody. The angels are saying, God just gave himself to save people. People who are sinners. People who do despicable things that they're even embarrassed about. See, this is something the devil can't do. Won't do. Because he is the devil. And he is big and proud, and he beats everybody with a continual stroke, but he won't give himself to save anybody. Nobody can do this but God. And God just did it. They're saying there's no one like God. God uses all of his power to become nothing, to save people. But that's what he's done. So they say, this is amazing. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Now this is what it all means. This is what the gift means. This is how expensive it means. When you give that gift, you know, wow, I really am somebody. This person thinks I'm somebody. They just gave me something that's so valuable I could never afford it. And it it means a lot. This is not a pink ballpoint pen. This is God himself. You know what that means? That means he's accepting us. He approves of us. Does he approve of what we do or think? No, he doesn't. But he accepts us and approves us anyway because Jesus is going to cleanse us and make us new. He accepts us. Isn't that phenomenal? So you never have to go around wondering, gee, did I do enough? Is God going to receive me? Or, if, or am I going to stand before God and he says, you and I both know you did lousy. Get away from me. Do you ever worry sometimes that you're not going to make it to heaven? You get scared thinking, I've done this 5,000 times now. If I were God, I wouldn't let me into heaven. Why should he let me into heaven? And yet here's what, it, what he's really saying. I accept you completely and utterly. This is what he means. This is the value that he puts on you. You are more valuable to me than all the universe everything that's in it, because I'm giving my son for you. The angels are going nuts. They have never seen anything like this in their whole existence. So, that's what Christmas is about. The first thing to do is receive that gift if you've never done it. Is that amazing? The most amazing, expensive gift there ever was? And it's for you? And you go, eh. Oh no. So what? You know, they, these angels know something that you don't. And that is the love of God. 
They're watching it and it's freaking them out. And the best thing in the world is to receive that love of God and to let it flood you. And so, you know, check it out, just like the shepherds did. Verse 15, they start looking at each other and saying, let's just go and do it. Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see what's happened. And if the shepherds could check it out, you can check it out too. And here's how you check it out. Get a Bible and start reading it. And say, God, is this really you? You show me. And if you do, he will do it. He will show you himself. And it'll surprise you. It surprised me. I was having a a kind of a blah morning a couple of mornings ago where you try to have a quiet time with God and it just wasn't happening. You want to see angels in heaven and all you see is kind of nod off. I have those mornings. You're trying to go, that's it. Can't get going. And the scripture that I was trying to meditate on is the one that's in your bulletin this morning, which I stuck there. And it's from Isaiah, or I'm sorry, Psalm 57. And it says, I will praise you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing to you among the nations, for your mercy reaches unto the heavens and your truth unto the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. And I sat there just kind of, so what? Your mercy reaches to the heavens, okay? So let me imagine your love going right up till it hits, I don't know, the next galaxy. Okay, I can see that's a lot of love. Your truth to the clouds, okay, great. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Above the heavens. What's that? What's above the heavens? I don't know. Well, how come you don't know? I don't know. How am I supposed to meditate on this? I don't know. What's above the heavens? Well, it says to me there's something more than what I know. Be exalted, God, above even what I know. Why is that happening in this psalm? Because there's something going on that's so incredible that that's how incredible God is beyond our understanding. I go, God, would you please help me to make this sense? I am not grasping this. And he directed me to Ephesians chapter 1. If you want to open up your Bibles there. And here's what the Apostle Paul says. And this is what God said to me. It's in chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our, Father, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Now that's a lot of words there. But what it says is that, first of all, God can give you the ability to understand. You say, I don't get it, help me. He will give you the Holy Spirit so that you can understand. 
and he wants you to understand what is his exceeding great power is. It's kind of abstract until he says, this is what the measure of power is, that he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him above everything in the heavenly places. You're talking about be exalted above the heavens? That's where Jesus is right now. That gives you a way to, to grasp it in your mind. Whatever that means, Jesus is right there at the very top. So you can do that too. You spend time with God. He will explain this to you so that you grasp it and realize what is the extent that we're talking about. And he will enable you to glorify God greatly, just like these angels. But one important thing you can do when you grasp this is to talk about it to people. That's what the shepherds did. It says here, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. That was enough for the angels to flip out about. And if the shepherds investigated and found out it was true, they figured it's worth telling everybody. And so they did. That's really what Christmas is about. God has done something amazing. He's done it to me. I want to tell you about it until you think it's amazing too. Now, the Sunday school class is going to sing a couple of songs for us. Shall we do that and have them come in? Nope, they know already, Colin. But let's pray in the meantime, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you place such a high value on us, that you accept us, even though we've done nothing for you to accept us. Thank you for giving us Jesus to be our Savior. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us your spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might grasp it. And that it would so grip us that we would tell others. Do that in our hearts, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind.